I'd like to welcome you to this program today of the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series with Professor Avinoam Pat of New York University. I'm Ron Duncan Hart, and thank you for joining us as we remember Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust Remembrance Day, which has special poignancy this year. The population of Jews in the world has just now come back to the level that it was at Kristallnacht. It has taken 86 years to regain the Jewish population lost in the Shoah. And in those years, Israel has been a bastion of Jewish life for all of us. Today, we are pleased that Professor Avinoam Pat is with us to talk about his new book, Israel and the Holocaust. He is the recently named inaugural director of the Center for the Study of Antisemitism at New York University, where he is also the Morris Greenberg Professor of Holocaust Studies. So congratulations, Professor Pat, on being named to this one of the most important positions in Jewish studies in the United States and a well-deserved recognition of your, your scholarship and um, quite a responsibility. So congratulations. Professor Pat is an award-winning, widely published author of books and articles on the Holocaust and other much needed Jewish topics such as Jewish humor which we might hear something about today. He did a program on that subject for the Distinguished Lecture Series in 2020, just as we were being sequestered because of COVID. And um, so many people responded to that, that is, uh, we've, we've had more than a thousand people watching this program, which has uh, been really wonderful. Uh, his books include Finding Home and Homeland, which was a winner of the Kahneman Publication Grant, he recently completed a book on the early post-war memory of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising called The Jewish Heroes of Warsaw, which was a finalist for the Yad Vashem International Book Prize. He is the co-editor of Laughter After, Humor and the Holocaust. And by my last count, this new book, Israel and the Holocaust, is your ninth book, I believe. Uh, you, you can correct me on that. Uh, and again, a well-written one that's on a part of Jewish history that we need to know about much more completely. I would like to mention that Professor Pat has spoken twice previously for the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series. And we would like to thank Drs. Hallie Faust and Eve Cohen for underwriting this program in honor of Yehuda and Nurit Pat of Jerusalem and Santa Fe. So it's my great pleasure today for Dr. Pat that you're with us, and um, we're looking forward to your talk. And as I might mention, this is the subject. Okay, thanks. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Ron, for that uh, kind and generous introduction. And thank you to the uh, Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series for uh, inviting me to uh, to speak today in honor of Yom HaShoah. And uh, thank you for uh, mentioning my parents and to the underwriters of today's talk for uh, for uh, dedicating it to uh, Yehuda and Reed Pat. Uh, uh, the next best thing to being in person in Santa Fe is to be able to do this on Zoom uh, on a webinar. So uh, thank you uh, for making this possible. The, the book, as uh, as you can see here on the screen, the book Israel and the Holocaust is a new project, and I'm going to try to address some of the key topics that uh, motivate the writing of the book and some of the issues that come up in the process of uh, writing of this book. But I also look forward to uh, to having some time at the end for us to discuss some of the, the issues that arise uh, from this discussion. So one of the central questions that the book tries to understand is why the Holocaust or Shoah, the Hebrew word for destruction, uh, occupies an increasingly central role in the collective memory of Israel, even as distance from the historical event continues to grow. Beyond frequent political uh, invocations of the Shoah, mandatory educational trips to Poland, the prominent place accorded to Yad Vashem, Israel's Holocaust Memorial Museum, as a destination for all political dignitaries. Survey data also supports the conclusion that more Israeli Jews identify, quote, remembering the Holocaust 
as an essential part of their Jewish identity than any other category. And this comes from the Pew Research Center's uh, study, which also mirrors the same findings from their portrait of Jewish Americans taken uh, just a year before this. So you can see 73% of American Jews identify remembering the Holocaust as a central component of their Jewish identity, 65% of Israelis. The proximity between the end of the Holocaust in 1945 and the founding of the State of Israel in 1948 seems to suggest a causal relationship between the two events. And some contemporary observers at the time even noted what they thought were theological and historical links. According to the historian Zev Mankovitz, for Holocaust survivors after their liberation from Nazi rule, creating a Jewish state in the land of Israel was taken to be the last will and testament bequeathed by the dead to the living, while the Zionist project also signified warmth, unquestioning acceptance and security of home, and the only real hope for the rescue and rehabilitation of the little that remained of European Jewry, and in the longer term, the promise of the Jewish future. And here you can see this is a, uh, uh, an image that was used by survivors in the aftermath of the war. This is from the first conference of liberated, the third conference of liberated Jews in April of 1948, before the creation of the state of Israel, which shows the map of partitioned Palestine over the broken uh, tree symbolizing European Jewry. So this is from the American zone of Germany in 1948. Uh, accordingly, from its inception, the state of Israel presented itself as a place of refuge for survivors. Israel's Declaration of Independence, read by David Ben-Gurion on May 14, 1948, asserted, and here I'll just quote from one paragraph of the declaration, the Nazi Holocaust, which engulfed millions of Jews in Europe, was another clear demonstration of the urgency of the reestablishment in Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel, of the Jewish state, which would open the gates of the homeland wide to every Jew and confer upon the Jewish people the status of a fully privileged member of the community of nations. The survivors of the European catastrophe, as well as Jews, continued to migrate to Eretz Israel, undaunted by, by difficulties, restrictions, and dangers, and never ceased to assert their right to a life of dignity, freedom, and honest toil in their national homeland. This is one paragraph we can discuss the much longer, it's in the context of much longer uh, declaration. Thus, in the self-understanding of many survivors, as well as the founders of the state, sovereignty could have been seen as the uplifting, quote, redemptive legacy of the Holocaust or the Shoah, and it's important, and we'll talk about this later, the terms that we use, engaging the Jewish people on a journey from catastrophe to rebirth, from crisis to redemption. But at the same time, Palestinians for whom the Nakba, Arabic for catastrophe, began with the founding of Israel in the subsequent 1948 war, also link Israel to the Holocaust, claiming that the international community gave the Jewish people Israel as a compensation at the expense of the Palestinians, who paid the price for what Germany did to European Jews. This claim, popular throughout the Muslim world, is often linked to outright Holocaust denial and the negation of Israel's right to exist. And the government of Iran has been at the forefront of Holocaust denial uh, cartoon contests, linking uh, the creation of the State of Israel with the Holocaust, and at the same time, alleging that uh, the Holocaust, uh, or the Shoah business, as you can see here, has been manufactured to justify the existence of the state. So it is striking that both friends and foes of Israel alike argue that Israel was founded because of the Holocaust. But a closer analysis of the years 1945 to 1948 indicates that the state of Israel was founded almost in spite of the Holocaust. The genocide had obliterated, in the words of Anita Shapira, the quote, central branch that had created multivalent Jewish cultures and was the Jewish people's reservoir of main reservoir of human resources. Without the single-minded dedication of the Shuv leadership to the creation of a state and the continued failure to solve the Jewish refugee crisis in the aftermath of the war, the Israeli state may never have come into existence. And we can discuss this in the Q&A. There are many reasons to believe that in the aftermath of the World War II, it was much less likely that the state would come into existence, and yet somehow it did come into existence after the Second World War. The Zionist movement had pursued the goals of state sovereignty long before the Holocaust, but the European Jewish catastrophe enhanced the determination to seek sovereignty over a piece of land, no matter how small, 
because a Jewish state was now deemed an existential necessity. The Shoah convinced Jews in the diaspora, especially in the United States, which now had the largest Jewish community in the world after the Second World War, of the need for a Jewish state. And I've written about this quite a bit, so I won't go into it now. But ultimately, the founding of Israel resulted from very real politic decisions of the international power players of the day. The British wanted to leave Palestine as fast as possible in the aftermath of the war, since their empire was collapsing. The Americans sought to find a settlement for the 250,000 Jewish displaced persons who were in their occupation zones in Germany and Austria. And it was a linking of the plight of the survivors in the aftermath of the war through, for example, the Harrison Report of August of 1945, and then the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry uh, in 1946, which linked the resolution of Jewish displacement in Europe with immigration to Palestine. As the stay of the Jewish displaced persons dragged on in Europe, DPs, and here you can see a, a picture, for example, and I apologize for skipping over some of this, but I'm happy to go back to it. Displaced persons staged mass protests condemning the British blockade and participated in the illegal immigration movement to Palestine. In February of 1947, the British referred the problem of Palestine to the United Nations, and following the Exodus affair in the summer of 1947, July of 1947, and then the report of the UN Special Committee on Palestine, November 29, 1947, the United Nations recommended the resettlement of Jewish DPs be dealt with through the establishment of a Jewish state. And so here you can see again this image um, at the Third Congress of partitioned Palestine as a resolution to the plight of the displaced persons after the war. Now, we can discuss some of the issues that went into this in the real politic decisions after the war, having to do with British and American power dynamics, strategic political decisions at the beginning of the Cold War, and other variables, but it's important to point out that it was not sympathy or guilt towards the Jews that led UN approval of the partition plan, paving the way for the establishment of the state. Um, it was other factors that they had to address in the aftermath of the war. National sovereignty and partition of territories based on nationality, along with population transfers, were the dominant model of international politics based on World War I precedent established at the Treaty of Lausanne. Even with an indirect causal connection between the Holocaust and Israel's founding at best, I think it's fair to say that the Jewish state exists in a very conflicted relationship with the traumatic event. On the one hand, from a Zionist perspective, Jews are a nation deserving their own nation state, just as every other nation. And here you can see this viewpoint of Jewish history expressed in the story uh, by uh, Chaim Chazaz, the sermon, this idea that all that Jews can associate with diaspora history is oppression, defamation, persecution, and martyrdom. And so the creation of a new Jewish people in the, in the Jewish homeland would overturn uh, years, uh, centuries, millennia of persecution. Zionism, in many respects, was predicated on the notion that Jewish life in the diaspora was harmful to Jews and therefore needed to be negated. Uh, this concept of shlila tagola, negation of the diaspora, since all efforts to achieve full equality and acceptance by the nations of the world would fail. The Holocaust then was the ultimate manifestation of that failure. Therefore, we can see that the memory of the Holocaust has been a constant presence in Israeli life, and it's deeply enmeshed with Israeli self-understanding, and yet at the same time, we can see this ambivalence perhaps expressed in the words of Naftali Bennett, 80 years after the Van Say conference in 2022, when he was prime minister at the time, saying Israel is not ours, be Israel is ours because it's the Jewish homeland, not because of the Holocaust, right? This awareness of the, uh, or ambivalence, or sort of the, the inter inherent conflict that exists in these two viewpoints. In recent decades, there's been a new vein of post-Zionist historiography comfortable in critiquing the development of the Zionist movement and the issue of leadership, which has attempted to study this history from uh, an objective non-Zionist viewpoint capable of incorporating the viewpoints of many other groups, including, as Tom Segev did in his work, uh, The Seventh Million, Holocaust survivors themselves, who as Segev predominantly was among them, argued the survivors had largely been co-opted by the state 
in previous historical treatments. And so these scholars investigated the Yishuv's response to the destruction of European Jewry and attitudes of Israeli society to Holocaust survivors in the first decades of the state. They also explored the role of survivors in building the state and how the trauma of the Shoah has shaped Israeli memory and identity. And so one of the things that I've tried to do in this new book, Israel and the Holocaust, written 30 years essentially after Segev's um, pathbreaking work, is to examine and demonstrate the ways that Israeli society has engaged with Holocaust memory, but to argue that it's not just determined by political elites, but complemented by broad societal engagement, spearheaded by survivors and their families. While labor Zionist politicians gave an ideological reading of the Holocaust towards a justification of how history could be overcome by national sovereignty, and determined how the European Jewish catastrophe should be remembered. And Ben-Gurion, I think, was especially wary of this reading of Jewish history. And so wanted to make sure, for example, on the Declaration of Independence, that all of the connections that the Jewish people have had throughout history to the land of Israel were articulated there. That it would be seen as is Jewish connection to the land of Israel as the birthplace of the Jewish people, the place where the Jewish people gave the book of books to the world, this is the roots of the connection, not some political determinations made after the Second World War. And yet, the political right since Menachem Begin have politicized Holocaust memory by invoking uh, the traumatic event as justification for almost all political decisions, foreign policy, military strength, diaspora relations, relations to the Palestinians and the Arab world. And yet what I try to argue is that politicians are only one of several agents in Israeli Holocaust memory operating in a dynamic interaction with other agents, in the courts, media, literature, culture, education, and elsewhere. And what we can see is that throughout Israel's existence, there has been an interplay between top-down political uh, attempts to control Holocaust memory and bottom-up engagement with it. The latter, this bottom-up engagement, has been part and parcel with global trends in memorial culture and the elevation of survivors since the 1990s that extend beyond the political sphere. And so in the time that remains, I would like for us to look at how the memory of the Holocaust in Israel and the debate over how central it should be in Israeli political life and collective memory in Israeli society has changed over time and how we can see survivors moving from the periphery to the center of Israeli uh, identity. So we're going to look at three components of, of what I look at in the book. And the first part we'll look at is the memory of the Shoah or the memory of the Holocaust as a challenge to Israeli national identity. And you can see here that I write refuting the myth of silence, because I think one of the things that's become uh, quite apparent in recent years is that there was no silence. Yeah, uh, it might maybe the ways that people talked about the war changed, but there was plenty of discussion and analysis uh, throughout uh, in public life in different ways. The Shoah took a prominent place in public life early on, although as we can see, there was a constant tension between the crafting of Holocaust memory by the political leadership of the new state and grassroots activity of survivors who sought to establish themselves there. Those who had spent the war in mandatory Palestine only had a limited understanding of the destruction of European Jews and tended to interpret it through the lens of Zionist ideology. Both political leaders, as well as the wider public, engaged in a polarized discourse, pitting, quote, heroes against victims against one another. On the one hand, we could see the few surviving Jewish partisans and ghetto fighters people like Roshka Korchak and Abba Kovner, partisans from Vilna, Zivi Lebetkin and Yitzhak Zuckerman uh, from Warsaw, and others who were welcomed in Israel with great excitement and respect. And indeed, their firsthand accounts, and here I'll skip ahead for now, their firsthand accounts to members of the political leadership and the institutions of the Yishuv received prominent public attention. So here you can see, for example, uh, Zivi Lebetkin addressing over 3,000 uh, members of the labor uh, movement, the kibbutz movement um, at Kibbutz Yagur on June 8, 1946, where she told them the story of the Warsaw ghetto uprising for eight hours at Kibbutz Yagur. 
the mordim, the resistors, were referred to as giborim or heroes and valorized for having saved the honor of the Jewish people. On the other hand, survivors who could not pride themselves in armed resistance met a wall of silence, disinterest, even impatience from veteran Israelis who believed that the majority of European Jews had either collaborated with the Nazis as members of Jewish councils, ghetto police, and as kapos, or had gone passively to their deaths like, quote, sheep to the slaughter. This polarized view of survivors also found expression in the terms that were used to describe them. Not only such terms like Nitzalei Shoah, or those who were rescued from destruction, but also derogatory terms for the dead, such as Avak Adam, or human dust, or this term Sabonim, referring to people as soap, which signified the supposed passivity of European Jews who were allowed, who allowed, quote unquote, to themselves to be murdered and turned into soap by Nazis instead of fighting them. This view resulted from a number of factors lack of knowledge of the complex nature of the Holocaust, as well as an ideological view that saw diaspora Jews as passive and rejected diaspora life. Uh, accordingly, the Holocaust was seen not as a crime sui generis, but as just another example of anti-Semitic violence that had been inherent in the nature and the condition of exile for centuries. And here I'm just showing you um, 1947, something that became a very a profound part of everyday life in the Yishuv and then the early years of the state, the search uh, for missing relatives, um, which you can see here. And we can also see that the lack of nuance and the perception of European Jewish catastrophe also resulted from psychological inhibitions. The focus on heroic resistance perhaps was a defense mechanism when many who lost relatives in the catastrophe struggled with the shock of, event, of an event too difficult to confront, along with feelings of guilt and a sense of shame that the Yishuv had not done enough to rescue European Jews. Just at the time, however, that the state in the making was absorbing large numbers of survivors and was assimilating information about their devastating wartime experience, the state became, the country became involved in an existential military conflict with survivors playing a key role in fighting. Uh, the contributions we could argue that survivors made to the 1948 war, however, did not dispel disparaging notions about new arrivals from Europe as weak, passive, and confused. And this is something that I write about in the book, the fact that survivors played a disproportionately large role in the fighting in 1948, but the literature, for example, you're having the talk next week uh, about the book by Yisar Smilansky, A Made Ziklag, The Days of Ziklag, an example of this literature that did nothing to dispel the notion that um, survivors uh, were seen as passive and weak, even though they played a disproportionately large role in the fighting in 1948. So now skipping ahead to the early years of the state, we could say that perhaps no event reflected the encounter between the pragmatic approach to mastering the past and the emotional reaction to German crimes than the intense debate over reparations from Germany. In 1951 and 1952, Israeli negotiations with Germany also reflected what we might see as an early example of the politicization of Holocaust memory. How would leaders wrestle with the meaning of the Holocaust in both political and economic terms? In the aftermath of the 1948 war, the absorption of hundreds of thousands of immigrants from Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa, including an estimated 500,000 survivors by 1960, Israel was on its knees economically. In these circumstances, David Ben-Gurion turned to West Germany to secure money to help the absorption process. Critics of negotiations with Germany argued that any money received from the Germans was, quote, blood money intended as an expiation for their crimes. Such was the accusation hurled at the government by opposition parties led by Menachem Begin's right-wing Kharut party when the proposed reparations agreement came to the Knesset in 1952. And here you can see an image of Begin addressing this huge crowd in Jerusalem. Uh, Our honor will not be, will not be sold in with money, um, uh, our, our blood, uh, cannot be traded for uh, merchandise or for goods, we will uh, erase the shame. Um, and indeed, this event, uh, which was, uh, you can see here this coverage in the Jerusalem Post, January 8th, 1952, 
a near riot, uh, that actually a riot that did take place outside of the Knesset. The day before the issue of the of the uh, revisionist Zionist party's newspaper, Harut, called on Israelis to, quote, remember what Amalek has done unto you and take their anger to the streets, labeling negotiators as traitors. This the newspaper included artwork and photograph of murdered Jews to remind readers there could be no reparations for the dead. On January 8th, as the Knesset debated this proposed agreement, Begin engineered a riot in which 100 policemen and civilians were injured. Nevertheless, the government did enter into negotiations with, with West Germany, which in the context of the Cold War was eager to enter the Western bloc of nations. And ultimately, here I'll just skip ahead to this picture. Ultimately, on September 10th, 1952, negotiating representatives signed the agreement in Luxembourg. Moshe Sharet, who you can see here in the center, Israeli foreign minister, Nachum Goldman, representing the Jewish Agency, the World uh, Jewish Congress, and Kadran Adenauer as foreign minister and chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany. In the reparations agreement, West Germany committed to supply the state of Israel with goods and services valuing three and a half billion marks over a period of 12 years. And Germany also assured personal reparations to victims and the return of stolen property. So we can see in the course of this event and the debate, the fight over reparations, against the fierce protests of large segments of the Jewish uh, of the population, the Israeli government made a pragmatic decision that Jewish people were better served by building the infrastructure of its state rather than letting the past stand in its way. And yet in the early years of the state at the same time, we can see Israeli lawmakers cementing and ritualizing Holocaust discourse through several laws, which were an expression of the polarized views on the Jewish catastrophe and its survivors, while demonstrating that the quote unquote new Jew had mastered the diaspora past. Um, so I'll just show you a couple of examples uh, of this. Um, the dedication so, of the Martyrs Forest in Jerusalem, April 19th, 1951, uh, the dedication of uh, uh, the monument at Kibbutz Yad Mordechai, uh, here you can see that. And in April of 1951, the Knesset passed a resolution to establish what became known as initially Yom Hazikaron, so Memorial Day, La Shoah Vemered Getaot. So initially a Memorial Day for the Shoah and the Ghetto Revolts, literally Holocaust and Ghetto Revolt Memorial Day, to be held on the 27th day of Nisan. Uh, so that's what we're marking when we mark Yom HaShoah. Tonight and tomorrow, that's exactly what we're marking, one week after the end of Passover, but still corresponding to the timing of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which itself lasted over four weeks. By placing Yom HaShoah on the calendar, one week before Israel's Memorial Day, Yom HaZikaron, commemorating fallen soldiers leading into Israel's Independence Day, Yom HaAtzma'ut, the state, in effect, in this week, established a commemorative calendar that has enshrined a national narrative arc leading from destruction, Mishoa, Litkuma, uh, to national rebirth. It would take until April of 1953 for the Knesset to pass the Martyrs and Fighters Remembrance Day Law, Yom HaShoah and April 1959, as you can see here, to prescribe a specific ritual, which included a two-minute silence with a siren at sundown and this will be tomorrow morning, 11 a.m., suspending all work and traffic, commemorative programs at educational institutions and the radio, flags on government buildings flying at half-mast, and a central government-sponsored memorial service at Yad Vashem. And indeed, in August of 1953, uh, the Knesset decreed the building, this is not what it looked like in 1953, the building of the Central Holocaust Memorial, Yad Vashem. We can see here is the much newer um, uh, which we could talk about the newer museum, um, the Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Authority on the western slope of Mount Herzl outside of Jerusalem. The idea to have a centralized memorial, which had already been conceived of in 1942 by Mordechai Shenhavi, had not been made a priority by Yishuv leadership. But now, in 1953, it was taken on by lawmakers in a struggle for hegemony over memory and research in the framework of a state-sponsored, centralized, and secular memorial and research institute to be located in Jerusalem. And I think it's important to note Yad Vashem was not the first Holocaust Memorial Museum in Israel. Um, as noted before, Yitzhak Zuckerman, Tzibi Lubetkin, 
and other surviving members of the ghetto fighters established the ghetto fighters house. This was established on the sixth anniversary of the revolt, April 19th, 1949. So just a year after uh, the founding of Israel, even less so in Akko at Kibbutz Lochamea Gettaot. And while Lochamea Gettaot, the ghetto fighters house celebrated Jewish resistance, there was another site um, called the Holocaust Cellar or Martef HaShoah on Halzion on Mount uh, Zion, which constituted a sacred memorial site. And it, this site was located as close to the Western Wall, the holiest site in Judaism, as possible in 1949, because uh, the old city was still under Jordanian control. So it was just outside of um, the, the old city, but as close as possible. <clears throat> this site uh, had the backing of the general director of the religious affairs ministry, Shmuel Zangvil Kahana, and it was a site that survivors created as an alternative cemetery for victims of the Shoah who had not been buried, with tablets in memory of every city whose residents had been massacred. Reflecting grassroots commemorative practices, survivors brought salvaged artifacts and objects, destroyed Torah scrolls covered in blood, and jars of ashes from camps to be interred at the cellar. Um, and here you can see some examples of what is on display, including this coat of revenge made from a Torah scroll and the memorial plaque to destroyed uh, communities. There are 2,000 of these in the cellar, which is located uh, in a cave under a yeshiva. Um, the site possessed and still possesses, you can still visit it today, a very religious character focused on demonstrating that Jews continued religious observance even during the Shoah. And I think it's important to know that in this sense, resistance was spiritual resistance, right? Maintaining Jewish practice, not armed physical resistance, but spiritual resistance. According to the scholar Daron Bar, compared to the secular nationalistic mission of Yad Vashem, which drew its authority from the sacred Zionist national space in Western Jerusalem and its proximity to Theodore Herzl's tomb and the military cemetery, the Holocaust seller drew its claim to authenticity from the East, namely from the Temple Mount, the old city of Jerusalem, and David's tomb, <clears throat> reflecting a conflict between secular and religious Zionist groups. And even uh, we could see this conflict playing out at Yad Vashem, where initially the first director was Ben Sion Dinur, Israel's education minister, um, who advocated for sort of a, a dispassionate, scholarly, archival-based approach to the writing of the history of the Holocaust, which prioritized graduates of the Hebrew University and argued that survivors themselves lacked scholarly expertise. But um, uh, eventually, Dinor stepped down in 1959, as many of the survivors who were working as historians at the museum won uh, the battle over public opinion. And indeed, we can see throughout the 1950s, survivor organizations and hometown societies, Landsmannschaften, organizing alternative ceremonies to commemorate the destruction of their communities, engaging the compilation of hundreds of Yisker books, memorial books in Yiddish and Hebrew. Something like 75% of all Yisker books were published in Israel and 62% of them were published in Hebrew, the rest uh, for the most part in Yiddish. In the Yiddish press throughout the 1950s, we see publication of specific sections dedicated to memorializing destroyed Jewish communities, such as in the newspaper uh, Let's De Nias. Um, and survivors indeed turned Tel Aviv into a vibrant Yiddish literary center where even uh, the ghetto uh, poet and partisan uh, Avram Sutzkever published the literary periodical The Golden Acade. Um, and you can see, and I'm just showing some images here from uh, the cemetery in Cholon, which has a remarkable collection of uh, memorials, memorial statues, um, where uh, communities uh, would gather to uh, commemorate the destruction of their towns, the yurt site of, for the most part, the massacres um, at this cemetery in Cholon, and again, a site that one can still visit and check out uh, today. Uh, in the 1950s, survivors were also publishing fictional accounts of the Holocaust, most notably the novels and novellas that appeared under the nom de plume of Katsetnik, uh, literally concentration camp inmate in Yiddish, Katsetnik, who was the author of Salamandra and House of Dolls and, and People. Um, Katsetnik, who was a survivor of Auschwitz, born in Poland as Yechiel Feiner, which he changed to Yechiel Dinur, remained anonymous until uh, the Eichmann trial 
And here you can see an excerpt of his testimony from the Eichmann trial, where he uh, described as a chronicle of the planet of Auschwitz, where he was for almost two years. Um, in the legal realm, we could also see a public space taking place in which state-sponsored official modes of addressing the Holocaust and its grassroots level counterparts converged. In August of 1950, so this is one of the first laws that the state of Israel passed, the Knesset passed the Nazi and Nazi collaborators punishment law, which was intended to prosecute Nazi war criminals, even though it was clear that these most would remain out of reach until the capture of Eichmann um, and the trial in 61 and then 62. Um, uh, the Israeli lawmakers, I think that we can see that they saw such a pressing need for such a law reflects perhaps what was a misguided perception about the idea that many Jews had been uh, collaborators. And on the basis of this law, Israeli courts tried 40 survivors for collaboration between 1950 and 1973, most of them in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, I won't dwell on this now, but one famous case of this was uh, the, the so-called Kastner affair, um, where he had been accused of uh, uh, by Malkiel Grunwald, who charged that through his negotiations, Kastner, a prominent figure, leader of Hungarian Jewry, that through negotiating with Adolf Eichmann and Kurt Becher over exchanging Hungarian lives for military, Jewish lives for military hardware and trucks, that he had participated in the destruction of Hungarian Jewry and personally benefited from his negotiations with uh, the SS. And this was a uh, cause celebre, uh, 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 huge uh, trial in 1955. Uh, Kastner was eventually um, ruled against um, and found that he had not been defamed with the presiding judge, Binyamin Binyam Alevi, saying that by saving 1,700 Jews on the Kastner train while failing to warn others that resettlement was deportation to gas chambers, Kastner had in effect sacrificed the majority of Hungarian Jewry in favor of those that he had chosen uh, to rescue. Eventually, um, even though the Supreme Court uh, overturned the ruling, uh, it was too late because Kastner uh, was assassinated. I think what we can see in this affair, though, is that it reflected the encounter between pragmatic state-based approaches to the past that lacked understanding of the complexity of the Holocaust and the emotional anger of survivors against powerless Jewish communal leaders that was mixed with a deep sense of guilt for having survived while loved ones had not. Um, as has been noted by many others, the Eichmann trial in 1961 changed perception of survivors in Israeli society and furthered a more nuanced historical understanding of the Holocaust itself. And we can see in this period of time from 61 to 77, uh, the sh important shifts that take place in terms of the place of the memory of the Holocaust in Israeli society. Um, I won't uh, dwell on the Eichmann trial uh, at length now, um, but uh, I think we can see that in this case, holding the trial in Jerusalem was an expression of Israeli uh, sovereignty as a representative of the Jewish people and of the victims of the Holocaust. And beyond establishing Eichmann's guilt, the trial was meant to instruct Israelis about the horrors of the Holocaust and the harmfulness of diaspora life. Um, Attorney General Gideon Hausner often clashed with the three judges who sought to uphold the cause of justice and keep the proceedings at a remove from the political sphere, even if this proved difficult. Hausner's carefully composed case against Eichmann encapsulated the history of the Nazi mass murder of European Jews in its entirety, and in that respect, it was what we can think of as the first, quote, Holocaust trial in the history of criminal justice. And here I distinguish it from uh, the Nuremberg trials, for example, which barely featured any survivor testimony. It also departed from previous war crimes trials in that the prosecution based its case primarily on oral evidence from survivors rather than perpetrator documents. Um, chosen carefully with the help of survivors, such as Rachel Auerbach, director of testimony collection at Yad Vashem, and Michael Goldman Gilead, Hausner's assistant, the life stories of 108 survivor witnesses representing different countries and diverse wartime experiences establish a general understanding of the scope and complexity of uh, the Holocaust. And here I'll just show you some examples. This is coverage of Rivka Yoselevka's uh, testimony in May of 1961. Um, 
Rivka Yoselevska, who had survived an Einsatzgruppen mass shooting near Pinsk after seeing her mother, father, sister, and young daughter, whom she was holding, murdered, holding in her arms, murdered. Hausner returned to her testimony um, uh, in his concluding arguments, arguing that she was a symbol of Jewish survival and rebirth, explaining that Yoselevska embodies in her person all that was perpetrated, all that happened to this people, they want to kill her, but she lives. They wanted to blot out her memory, but she has brought forth new children. The dry bones have been given sinews. Flesh has grown upon them. They have taken on skin. They have been infused with the spirit of life. Rivka Yoselevska symbolizes the entire uh, Jewish people. The trial, of course, received widespread public attention. Ordinary citizens from all walks of life lined up to watch at the Beit Ha'am, a concert hall turned courtroom, which had accommodated 750 spectators per day. And scores of people gathered in public places to listen to broadcasts from the tribunal, as there was no TV in Israel yet, responding with profound shock and emotional turmoil. Even if much of the testimony proved legally irrelevant, it had tremendous historical significance. According to Deborah Lipstadt, the trial gave, quote, a voice to the victims that they had not had before and would compel the world to listen to the story of the final solution in the way that they never had uh, before. And... I won't spend a lot of time on it now, but you can see different examples of some of the survivors who testified them and a new approach to understanding their experiences um, during the war. In many respects, the survivor um, as such began to be valued as, quote, a bearer of a foundational history. No matter what their survival strategy or politics, they were lifted in many respects uh, after the trial from a place of weakness and shame to a place of authority. And yet, at the same time, understanding the scope of death and destruction during the Holocaust also augmented the sense of Israel's vulnerability and fears that the catastrophe would repeat itself in Israel's ongoing wars. And indeed, in the crisis that preceded the Six-Day War of June 1967, when Egyptian leader Gamal Abdel Nasser threatened Israel with annihilation, promising to, quote, wipe Israel off the map, eventually resulting in the preemptive strike against Egypt, and then uh, Syria and Jordan, the memory of the Holocaust formed a critical frame of reference that guided public and political rhetoric where comparisons of Nasser to Hitler were commonplace. And indeed, you can see um, Tom Segev quotes in The Seventh Day, uh, a soldier who said, people believed we would be exterminated if we lost the war. We got this idea or inherited it from the concentration camps. It's a concrete idea for anyone who has grown up in Israel even if he personally didn't experience Hitler's persecution. Genocide, it's a real possibility. There are the means to do it. That's the lesson of the gas chambers. These lessons also seem to guide Israeli foreign policy after the war, as questions of what to do with the conquered land and the millions of Palestinians now living under military occupation began to dominate diplomatic discussions. The Israeli foreign minister, Abba Iben, although a proponent of a peace agreement that would involve some exchange of territory, invoked the memory of the Holocaust in resisting return to pre-Six-Day War uh, borders for an Israel surrounded by Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. As he said in an interview with Der Spiegel, which you can see here, for us, this is a matter of security and of principles. The June 1967 map is for us equivalent to insecurity and danger. I do not exaggerate when I say that it has for us something of a memory of Auschwitz. And after 1967, we can also see religious Zionist adherents of the newly formed Gusha Munim, the Bloc of the Faithful Settler Movement, for whom the conquest of the West Bank and the old city of Jerusalem, the return of the Western Wall, the Temple Mount, and numerous biblical sites of the Jewish state seemed to be playing out on a meta-historical theological level that had post-Holocaust implications. Some even interpreted um, the events in messianic terms. And Eliezer Gan Yichia, in his analysis of the thought of Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda Kuk, writes, the establishment of Jewish independence in the Jewish homeland in the wake of the most tragic event in Jewish history signaled for Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda the actual beginning of the messianic era. And with it, the divine obligation incumbent on all Jews to take part in the continuing process of redemption by defending and extending Jewish presence and sovereignty in the land of Israel. And I'll just note um, in this period afterwards. Uh, so I'm showing you here a picture, here you can see. Um, this is a statue dedicated by uh, Natan Rappaport, 
um, which he worked on. So the same uh, sculptor who created the monument to the ghetto fighters in Warsaw created this Megillata Esh, Scroll of Fire, after the Six Day War, in which again, he enshrines this sort of relationship, Mishoalit Kuma, from destruction to rebirth, showing that in the aftermath of the Holocaust on the second scroll, you can see uh, the Jewish people ascending and returning back to uh, the holy sites in Jerusalem. Here you can see it there, returning in a sense, the menorah to uh, the old city of Jerusalem. And for scale, there you can see my mother, Nareet Pat, standing at the bottom right. So it gives you a sense of um, uh, how large this monument uh, is uh, standing in the martyr's forest in the outskirts of Jerusalem. And I would say that um, in the aftermath of the Six Day War, not only do we have a Gush Emunim um, making these uh, equivalencies, uh, certainly even before the Yom Kippur War, we can think about the launching of the terrorist campaigns by uh, the PLO, the Munich massacre in 1972, right? It only seemed to heighten such continued parallels. In many ways, uh, even though Israel emerged victorious in, uh, in the Yom Kippur War of October 73, the surprise nature of the attack, heavy Israeli losses at the start of the war, dependence on American military support, reinforced a sense of Jewish victimhood that had come to occupy a central place in Israeli collective identity. Um, and, and I think in many respects, in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War and the losses suffered during the Yom Kippur War, there was a re-traumatization of Israeli society. And along with a shift from a collectivist to a more individualistic ethos and the empowerment of the Mizrahi electorate against an Ashkenazi labor Zionist elite, this helped lead to the political victory of Menachem Begin and the Likud, who would make ample use of the Holocaust as a justification for Israel's need for sovereignty and deterrent military strength. After the collapse of the labor governments that had dominated Israeli politics since its founding, the election of Begin in May of 1977 solidified the memory of the Holocaust as a central cornerstone of Israeli political life and foreign policy. Begin, who had fled the German occupation of Poland to be imprisoned in Soviet forced labor camps in Siberia, and before coming to Palestine in 1942, lost his parents and brother in the Holocaust. His entire political career, from the battle against reparations to the anxious period before the Six Day War, was shaped by the Holocaust. And as Tom Segev has written, he did more than anyone, anyone else to politicize it. When he received the 1978 Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to achieve peace, he invoked the Holocaust at the White House Peace Treaty signing ceremony in March of 1979, identifying himself as one of the generation of the Holocaust and redemption and recalling um, his parents. Um, we can see throughout uh, the 1980s this deepening identification with the memory of the Shoah across a broad spectrum of Israeli society. We see it in film. We see it in uh, the impact that Claude Lanzmann's Shoah had when it was uh, first broadcast uh, uh, in Israel after uh, 1985. We can see the inauguration of the March of the Living, uh, which was established in 1988 and became an initiation ritual for high school uh, seniors before they would serve in the army. 1980s and 90s, we see a plethora of literary, cinematic, artistic depictions of the Holocaust that became an integral part of school curricula and Yom HaShoah commemoration. Um, and we can even see um, more prominent figures like the chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Israel Meir Lau, um, uh, recounting and sharing their stories of survival, right? As a child uh, who survived in Buchenwald, this becoming sort of a prominent uh, feature of um, the contributions of all survivors to Israeli society becoming a point and a way of connection for a diverse uh, spectrum of Israelis to connect with Israeli national identity. And with the move to the political right that began with Begin, and especially under Benjamin Netanyahu, I think it's safe to say that Israelis have internalized a much closer relationship to the Shah and references to the extermination of European Jews have become commonplace in the political sphere, both in internal political debates as well as in foreign policy and especially relationships with Palestinians, Arab neighbors, which have uh, come to increasingly be understood through this prism of the Holocaust. Again and again, from the destruction of the Iraqi nuclear reactor, the invasion of Lebanon, 
the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, the first Intifada, the failure of the Oslo Accords, terrorist attacks of the second Intifada, protests of the Gaza disengagement, the second uh, Lebanon War, and the present threat posed by potentially nuclear Iran, um, and now the war with Hamas, the Holocaust serves as the ultimate reference point and is constantly invoked. And I, I won't go into detail here, but you can see it being used increasingly for political purposes. For example, um, opponents of Rabin's policy uh, in, in the West Bank towards the Palestinians, accusing him of being a member of the Judenrat or leading us like lambs uh, to the slaughter. Or in the same way, we can see opponents of the Gaza uh, disengagement sort of invoking the memory of the Holocaust in uh, protests, both through the orange stars and uh, lifting hands like the boy in the Warsaw ghetto. Um, and while this is evidence that in many ways, uh, the Shoah has become crucial to Israeli self-understanding and collective memory, it is the frame of reference and primary association for most segments of society and for a new generation of political leaders descended from Holocaust survivors. And there are, there are many of them now, for example, Murad Mikhaeli, um, still the leader of the Labor Party for now, Benny Gantz, Sierra Lapid, all children of uh, survivors for whom it's central to their own identities. Yet at the same time, it also shows the ways in which the Holocaust memories, use and abuse has become increasingly um, politicized. And I, I just wanna note that there are voices that are arguing that this is unhealthy. Um, for example, Avraham Borg, um, who argues the Holocaust is over, let us rise from its ashes, and says that it's dangerous for the collective identity for the Holocaust and memory of the Shah to play such a central component in uh, national identity. Um, we can see also even um, in the sphere of humor, um, the ways in which there are critiques of the centrality of Holocaust memory to Israel's political identity um, that is satirized in many respects in the sphere of Jewish humor as well. And sorry, I'm gonna skip those videos for now. And we see efforts to push back against uses of the Holocaust in the political sphere, whether through more intimate, private commemorative activities like Azikaron Basalon, memory in the living room, or in historical writing, which asks to discuss in the interconnectedness of the Holocaust and the Nakba, uh, for Jews and Palestinians to develop more empathy towards each other, so the historical traumas. Um, or we can see sort of uh, on the one hand, it's invocation for political critiques on both sides, and then those who critique uh, these uses of uh, Shoah imagery um, uh, as trivializing the memory of the Holocaust. So just one word of, of conclusion, which is that Regardless of what the historical record suggests about the challenges of drawing a straight line from the liberation of the camps to the establishment of the state, in collective memory, the two events, Shoah and Tkuma, become inextricably linked in broad public understanding of that history. And as time grows from that event and the last living eyewitnesses pass, memory of the Holocaust, memory of the Shoah, holds a central place in Israeli national collective national identity, and it increasingly becomes the prism through which Israelis understand both their past and the nature of their present relationships with the Arab world and the wider uh, world. On October 7th, 2023, Hamas terrorists launched a full-scale surprise attack and invasion of Israel, massacring civilians, raping women and girls, dismembering bodies, taking hostages, and indiscriminately firing thousands of rockets and missiles at population centers throughout the country. With 1,200 Israelis murdered, nearly 3,000 wounded, 240 people, including women, children, and the elderly abducted and taken as the hostages into Gaza, this was, as been invoked numerous times, uh, the largest mass killing of Jews since the Holocaust. Many Israelis began to talk about their traumatic experiences of October 7th through Holocaust references. And we can even see the tools of Holocaust memory being used to commemorate uh, the event itself. Um, some Israeli leaders have referred to Hamas as, quote, the new Nazis to justify uh, military operations in Gaza. Hamas, for its part, having held the genocidal fantasy of wiping Israel off the map since its 1988 manifesto and, re uh, and vowing to repeat October 7th indefinitely, have called the IDF Nazis and Israeli civilians Nazi settlers. 
So it's clear that in the aftermath of this catastrophic day and the war that follows, Israel will never be the same. The notion that Israel exists to protect the lives of Jews from murderous violence has been shaken as the state seems to have failed in its mission. And yet it seems clear that for Israelis and many Jews and non-Jews around the world, the memory of the Holocaust serves as a strong reminder for why Israel must exist and defend its citizens. For many Israelis, the atrocities of October 7th will likely cause a deeper identification with the history of Jewish suffering um, during the Holocaust. We do not know what the future will bring, but the relationship that I trace in the pages of this book between Israel and the Shoah seem like they will be bound ever closer in the collective memory of the nation. Thank you. Avi, thank you for, let's see just a moment, we're, uh... here we go. Thank you for leading us through that history and helping us understand um, those important points. Uh, we have we have questions, and um, if we can, let's go to those immediately. Uh, see, uh, Stephen Ross says a significant portion of the Palestinian population is derived from the Turk uh, Turkish Ottoman refugee placement. Uh, let's see if I can get through this. Um, let's see. Um, it's it's getting into the the issue of um, Yugoslavia and uh, Bosnia and some of the, the the issues around that that were involved and and asking why there hasn't been more attention to those other refugee uh, uh, placement things. So I, I don't know if you have any comment on that or. So I'm not sure if that if the um, let me just take a look at the question. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean there's a. I, I would say, and one of the things that we have to wrestle with um, is sort of what is the, uh, um, when we think about Holocaust memory, right? Um, and we, we should pay attention to sort of the different ways in which the Holocaust is remembered and this question of why do we remember the Holocaust and how do we remember the Holocaust in different parts of the world? And so it's interesting to note that we're, holding this program sort of in conjunction with Yom HaShoah, so Israel's uh, National Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is distinct. Some of you might be familiar with that there is an International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which takes place on January 27th, um, a date that is uh, was chosen by the United Nations to mark the liberation of Auschwitz um, by uh, Russian soldiers with the Red Army, um, uh, Soviet soldiers. And so that's an interesting sort of counterpoint because the question is, do we draw uh, particularist uh, sort of um, uh, uh, specific Jewish lessons from how we remember the Holocaust in which we say um, we must remember the Holocaust as a, as a lesson to Jews all over the world for why there needs to be a strong Israel, right? So that's sort of, a, let's say, an Israeli specific Zionist reading, a political reading of the what, why I remember the Holocaust versus what I think Stephen is getting at, which is the um, a more universal uh, uh, aspiration of Holocaust memory. Shouldn't um, the memory of the Holocaust drive all who remember the Holocaust to uh, derive a universal meaning, which will lead to more empathy, sympathy for the plight of all people in suffering, right? Have empathy for refugees all over the world, including sort of the, the plight, I think, as alluded, as alluded to here, the plight of Palestinian refugees. And um, what I'll say is, I think, right, uh, there, there is no, uh, no one right argument or another. What I think is important, though, is that um, we have to be aware of how those things are playing out, and we have to be aware of the context in which um, the memory is being invoked. And one of the things that I've tried to be careful about here is um, to be aware of when that memory is politicized, right? So um, are we using it to put forth a political argument? And when we're using it to put forth the political argument, are we um, minimizing the actual sort of meaning of the event itself of what happened to European Jews uh, during the war? Okay, all right. Um, and from Narit Pat, we have a remark 
the ceremony in Israel at this moment is, is partially dedicated to the kibbutzim, which were started by survivors in Europe and then reestablished in Israel. Um, th th that reminds me of your earlier book um, about immediately after the Shoah, that um, the, the Homeland book, where people in Europe were beginning to set up, preparing themselves, training themselves in a way for eventually going to Israel. And um, the I, one of the things that stood out to me that I remember in that book was there were there were like kibbutz that were set up on f the former territories that were owned by Nazi officials. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And we so get that, all that transference to Israel. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, but what's interesting um, and what's interesting about the, the comment that my mom makes there about sort of dedicating it to um, kibbutzim that were established by survivors after the war in Israel is yes, you're you're right as you point out, Ron, that um, there is this fascinating and little known uh, history about the immediate aftermath of the war that there are a lot of agricultural training farms established by um, survivors in post-war Germany. Um, so you have this large population of survivors in the aftermath of the war and um, largely drawn towards Zionism and Zionist political thinking in the aftermath of the war, sort of as the obvious conclusion for them that there is no future for Jews in Europe and that the only solution in the aftermath of the war is to create the Jewish state. This was a very strongly held idea among um, survivors in the aftermath of the war. So we have these kibbutz groups that are formed in Europe to essentially train them for their future lives in the land of Israel. But what's interesting and noteworthy about sort of a ceremony now that's dedicated to the role that survivors played in establishing kibbutzim is that the state, and I think this gets into the ambivalent nature of the early leadership like Ben-Gurion and the labor Zionist, um, the youth movements, for example, they did not want to let survivors who had formed kibbutzim in post-war Germany reestablish those kibbutz groups um, in, in Israel because they were concerned about what would happen if you had kibbutzim that were established only by survivors. They wanted to facilitate, uh, let's say, the assimilation of the surviving population into Israeli national identity. They didn't want to have people who were survivors and then creating core groups just surrounded by survivors. And so they generally wouldn't allow survivors to establish their own kibbutzim and they broke them up um, into different groups. Uh, so for example, kibbutz lochamea getot is one of the only ones where you have um, survivors allowed to establish their own kibbutz. That's because they were the Warsaw ghetto fighters. Um, kibbutz Buchenwald, uh, which Judy Balmel has written about, um, most of the members are, are um, end up either at Netzer Sereni or at other kibbutzim, but they're divided against different kibbutzim. One of the kibbutzim that I write about, um, kibbutz Luchamei Gatot, Ashan Tosi Altman, they're broken up into different kibbutzim. Some end up at kibbutz Gazit and in other places. And so it's interesting, and I think it's noteworthy that we can see sort of this coming full circle to honor the role that survivors have played in establishing kibbutzim today, which is a far cry from what the state was doing in, in 1949-1950. You know, there's an, uh, a question from an anonymous attendee who is asking, I mentioned that Netanyahu has recently likened the protesters on, on college campuses in the United States to Hitler youth. Um, and so the question goes to, to say, you know, what what is he doing with this, this reference? Um, and we might take this opportunity to ask you about your own experience on the mm. um, New York University campus. Um, and um, if you like to respond to um, this this question about Netanyahu. Sure. So first of all, I'll say that sort of that, um, those types of analogies are sort of cheap political trivializations. Um, and and I think this is a, an example of sort of using, I, I don't know if the, the question asks about scoring points, but I would say, yes, I think it is just using um, historical analogies in the memory of the Holocaust to try to score points. Um, I think, uh, you know, in this, in, in in the present moment, um, it's it's a little bit different from uh, 1930s uh, Germany for uh, a number of reasons. Um, one is, you know, let's remember the state of Israel does exist. 
right? And it, it did not exist in, in the 1930s. But I also think that, um, you know, what we're seeing on on college campuses, it's not so simple to just say that it's uh, it, it's a it's a complex nexus of different groups that are coming together. Um, some of whom, you know, are are deeply concerned about what's happening um, in the war. Deeply concerned is the initial question asked about um, the suffering of Palestinians, um, and uh, and then right. Uh, so you see people mobilized by that. And then you also have um, groups that are very much opposed to the existence of the state of Israel, but I would, um, you know, and, and you have sort of a spectrum, um, but I wouldn't lump everyone together. I think you, as, as in most cases, you have a spectrum of some people who um, might be sort of justifying and rationalizing the actions of Hamas. Um, and if they are justifying and rationalizing the actions of Hamas, uh, as I've said, right, this is a, essentially a geno genocidal organization that wants to wipe uh, Israel off the map. Um, then there's there's uh, credence to sort of making those types of analogies, but I wouldn't. I think I think we have to be careful about sort of labeling everything with a broad brush. I think it's far more complex um, what's actually happening uh, on campuses. And of course, um, this is one of the, the things that are happening now on the campuses uh, concern many people because of and the parallels have been drawn about the the years before the Shoah. Um, and this is, of course, a, something that's a, a major concern going beyond just what's happening in the college campuses, but about Jewish life in the United States. And um, so this... Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, you know, one of the things that... that so what what is so alarming and concerning is um, that you see this sort of, uh, just as I said, we have to be careful about not sort of labeling all protesters with a product brush. At the same time, they need to be uh, much more careful about sort of distinguishing between what would be, you know, uh, criticism of the state of Israel and the policies of the Israeli government. Fine, okay, like we're all open to, entitled to have whatever criticism we might have. Let's remember that in the 40 weeks before October 7th, there was a very active protest movement that was protesting the actions of the government um, in, in Israel and the so-called judicial reform. But the danger has been in targeting all Jews, right? Targeting all Jews and Jewish institutions as sort of representation. And that's where as representation of Israel and symbolic of Israel. And that's what is so alarming that we've seen is this line that has crossed from, let's say, critique of Israel or what some might even call anti-Zionism, where they critique sort of the underpinning of the Zionist movement, Zionist ideology, and then using that and crossing that line very, very easily to attacking Jews uh, on campus, Jewish students, Jewish organizations, attacking the, the Hillels on campus, calling for boycotts of Jewish faculty members, calling for boycotts of any classes that have to do with Israel studies. Um, centers for Israel studies calling for, um, so we can see how this line is very easily crossed. And then we end up in this very dangerous place where I am extremely alarmed about um, the possibilities of uh, the spread of this um, BDS boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. Um, and, you know, I, I applaud those places that have been sort of strong in enforcing their uh, university's regulations around um, sort of what type of protests will be accepted and not, and also clamping down and making sure that they cannot target specific groups of students just on the basis of their identity, right? And so that's um, where I think we have to be very aware of where those lines have been crossed. Professor Pat, thank you very much for being with us today. This has been um... In, in in you know having looked at the book and knowing the detail that's here, um, I'm amazed how much of this you were able to pull out in your talk today. And thank you, we appreciate you for leading us into this new area of information. So this is the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series for today, and um, we thank Professor Pat, and we look forward to future programs and future programs that you can be with us with your next books that are coming. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ron.